Hey everyone, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. I'm excited to introduce this new series in the show called The Human Potential Lab. In this series, we're going to answer your burning questions about psychology and human potential. And now I get to nerd out and show my enthusiasm for science and psychology to you all and really hopefully unravel a lot of the mysteries that we all have about what in the world is going on with humans. We're going to start off today with the question of what is intelligence, which is a topic that has interested me for a very long time. Ever since I was a kid, I've wondered what does it mean to be smart? Does it simply mean high IQ? Are there other ways of being intelligent? Do multiple intelligences exist? What does it mean to be generally intelligent? As a kid, I was placed into special education due to an auditory learning disability, which I eventually outgrew. In special ed, I would look around and see greater potential among all my friends than other people gave them credit for. This ignited my passion for understanding intelligence, which carried me through to college where I started to scientifically study this fascinating topic, and I've been studying this topic ever since. In today's episode, I'm going to focus just on the facts and the science and attempt to show you why this topic really is so fascinating and so important to study for a broader understanding of how to unlock the potential of all people. So without further ado, here is your first episode of the Human Potential Lab series. Let's start off with the question, what is intelligence? And acknowledge, first of all, that in different cultures, people have viewed intelligence in different ways and have defined it in different ways. So in Chinese philosophy, you know, the Confucian perspective emphasizes benevolence and doing what is right. Um, under that philosophy, the intelligent person is the one that enjoys learning and persists in lifelong learning with enthusiasm. Um, you may have Taoist approaches that emphasize the importance of humility or the freedom from conventional standards of judgment and the full knowledge of oneself and of external conditions. Well, if you go onto Google and you type in, what is intelligence? Uh, Dictionary.com will give you a definition that's very much in line with a Western definition or a Western understanding, probably what many listeners of this show immediately conjure up when they think of the word intelligence. And that's, the def that's defined as the capacity for learning, reasoning, understanding, and similar forms of mental activity. Aptitude in grasping truths, relationships, facts, meanings, etc. You know, that's an actually reasonable definition of intelligence, I think. But uh, there's a difference between the conceptual understanding of what intelligence is and how it tends to be measured. And we're going to be focusing a lot on the measurement today. Uh, when you look at the history of IQ tests, a lot of it traces back to a Frenchman by the name of Alfred Brunet, who was tasked by the Department of Education to come up with a test that would differentiate those who would need remedial help from those who you know, wouldn't need remedial help or just fine in the classroom. Um, and that was it. Uh, that was all that the, he was tasked with. Um, and he came up with a test that he never called an intelligence test. Uh, he just came up with a test designed to measure the ability to profit from explicit instruction. And in fact, it were the Americans who got a hold of the test and were like, oh, this is amazing. Let's use this test in all sorts of ways to it, limit potential. Um, you know, such as people coming in from Im immigrants coming in from like Ellis Island or um, for army recruits and uh, various ways to see whether or not people are intelligent to uh, be able to pass some sort of threshold. That really wasn't the original intention of Binet. In fact, the original intention, uh, the, in fact, uh, the, the use of the Americans, um, once they got a hold of Binet's tests, uh, really fundamentally betrayed Binet's original spirit of the test. And uh, Binet, you know, towards the end of his life, he wrote how upset he was that the Americans betrayed that. And Binet made it very clear that intelligence testing or, or his type of testing, because he never called it an intelligence test, requires individualized uh, testing between one person, a trained, competent psychologist, and a person. Um, so uh, intelligence tests uh, really stem from those earliest measures by Binet. And the way intelligence tests are typically measured, um, and these are just some sample IQ test items, what you tend to find on an IQ test are a whole like cognitive smorgasbord of tests, from uh, arithmetic kinds of tests to vocabulary tests to reading comprehension to um, similarities, like in what way are dogs and rabbits alike. Um, 
Uh, and so it's just a whole kind of cog cognitive uh, smorgasbord um, of tests. And what's really interesting is that you do find that these tests tend to positively correlate with each other. Psychologists call this the G factor. People who are ten, people who tend to be good at vocabulary kind of questions do tend to be good at um, arithmetic or tend to be good at uh, block design, you know, taking a, um, a block and uh, make, putting it to its correct configuration. Um, and so there, there does tend to be uh, a positive correlation there. And people who tend to be score poorly in one test tend to score poorly in all the, poorly in all, all the other kind of subtests. Now, these aren't perfect correlations by any stretch of the imagination, but you do see a positive correlation, um, suggesting there is something uh, called general intelligence uh, that people differ on. Um, and that's, uh, you know, quite controversial in, in certain circles, but it seems to become less controversial if we frame it in other domains. For instance, do you remember the physical fitness test you took in school? Uh, where you had to like uh, do the the long jump or high jump. Uh, you had to like I remember we we had this chalk test where you had to run as quick as possible from one side to the other. Uh, and uh, what you find is if you have a whole sorts of smorgasbord of physical fitness tests, they tend to po correlate positively as well. You know, people who tend to do uh, pretty well on one of these kinds of physical fitness tests tend to do better than others on other tests of physical fitness, forming an F factor or physical uh, or fitness factor. Um, but within the realm of mental ability or cognition, you know, things get a little bit more controversial for, for, for many reasons. But let's stick to the, the science for a second. Um, because what you find is that while all these things positively correlate with each other, not all te IQ type tests are equally as valid a measure of this general intelligence. You can actually lay out on a uh, what looks like a dartboard uh, various kinds of tests and in three in, in, you know in different spaces and ask the question, well what tests really are tapping more into uh, a general form of intelligence than other kinds of tests? And we could start at the very perimeter of this dartboard before we before we throw the dart right at the center to what is the, the key of general intelligence. Let's start at the periphery. And when we start at the periphery, we have kinds of uh, very mindless kinds of tasks like uh, number comparison, W, digit symbol, um, identical figures, auditory letter span, just repeating things back, you know, simple memory things. Um, which don't tend to be that strongly correlated with IQ uh, or the or the whatever is in common across all these different kinds of tests on an IQ test. Um, when you uh, let's go closer to the center of the target, you have things like W object assembly, listening comprehension, vocabulary recognition, quantitative achievement. Um, so you know, uh, not as co cognitively complex. Um, you can, uh, but a little bit more cognitively complex than just repeating things back. Um, let's. You know what, let's go all the way to the center, to the target. When you go all the way to the center, you find that congregating around that center target, you know, what is the, 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 the target of, of general intelligence, you find it has a lot to do with analogical reasoning. Um, and maybe the content doesn't matter. Maybe it's not, maybe it's verbal analogies or geometric analogies um, or letter series like A, B, C, D, what comes next. I uh, hope you all got that one right, <laughs> or else you're in trouble. <laughs> um, yeah, and so when you go to kind of the center there, um, you find that some, there's something about analogical reasoning that seems to be most strongly correlated with general intelligence, that people who are good at that kind of reasoning tend to be good at a whole wide range of forms of reasoning and problem solving and things that we want to call intelligence. It turns out psychologists call that fluid reasoning. And one of the best measures of that is the Raven's Advanced Progressive Matrices Test, or the Raven Advanced Progressive Matrices Test. And uh, and this is just an example of a Raven's kind of item. Uh, for those who are listening to this just on the auditory podcast, you might want to watch the YouTube video for the for the videos uh, for the for the slides. But what you see here is that you have a sequence of geometric figures, and you have to fill in the missing piece uh, across and down. And I've highlighted here the answer. Uh, so uh, usually in my lectures, I ask my students or I ask people to kind of figure out the answer, then I'll give them some time to come up with it. But today I'll just uh, show you the answer. And 
I'm sure most of you, I'm sure most of my listeners here would have figured this out. You're all very smart people, but this is a, uh, you're all smart in terms of food reasoning, I'm sure. But this is uh, considered a moderately difficult test item on the Raven uh, test. And what you find is, well, what does it, what does it take to be, be good at this test? Well, to be good at this food reasoning test, you have to be able to integrate various things and hold various features in your working memory at the same time. Uh, size, shape, you know, in some instances that things differ by another feature such as color. Um, and what you have to do is you have to hold one piece of information in your head at one time while you're figuring out other pieces of information and then integrating them to find out what the overarching pattern is. Well, it turns out that ability to uh, to score an, uh, well on these kinds of fluid reasoning tests is correlated with a particular brain network called the executive attention brain network. And the executive attention brain network is really important for having uh, focused attention uh, and being able to uh, hold multiple things in your working memory at one time and synthesize and integrate them. Um, you can train artificial intelligence programs to solve Raven items pretty well. So if, uh, if this is what you view as all there is to intelligence, then, then, uh, computers are already pretty intelligent. You know, you can, they can, you can program them to, to come up with patterns and things. I also think, uh, in defense of fluid reasoning ability for a second, I do think it's important. You know, I think that, uh, if you have the ability to fill in the blanks quickly in a situation, you're going to be more adaptable. And that is a reasonable aspect of intelligence. Um, when, and then, so let's ask the question, what is the correlated with? Well, this kind of ability is pretty strongly correlated with school achievement. Surprise, surprise, you know, in the school system, we have lots of tests that are uh, what psychologists would call G-loaded or uh, really draw heavily on general intelligence uh, or fluid intelligence. Uh, some people, by the way, think fluid intelligence is uh, synonymous with general intelligence, uh, whereas others argue that general intelligence comprises fluid reasoning as well as knowledge, like what's called crystallized intelligence. And more on that, more on that in a second, because we're getting ahead of ourselves. But um, when you look at the correlation between IQ and academic achievement, what you find is there is a pretty strong correlation. People who tend to score higher on IQ tests or measures of general intelligence do tend to do better on school tests and do tend to be better at standardized tests of academic achievement. But I think it's also important to recognize that this is not a perfect correlation. And a lot of people, a lot of kids do fall between the cracks. Remember, that was Benet's original intention here was to find the kids falling between the cracks. But here's what I mean by falling between the cracks. I think that there are a lot of ways in which schools use IQ as a measure of prediction. And then they expect that they're going to uh, be able to forecast the child's future on these on these kinds of tests or in school, and sometimes even beyond that and in, in, into life. And I never think we should use IQ tests in childhood as a way to forecast someone's life potential uh, for, for many reasons. But uh, what you see here in this chart is that while 50% of people uh, do tend to underperform uh, what, based on what they would be predicted of them based on their IQ score on academic achievement tests, 50% overperform. And that's a really big deal. Um, and that's really important to recognize. 50% overperform uh, on academic achievement tests based on their predicted performance on IQ tests. So that is really important to keep in mind in, in our models in schools and, and in, 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 in life, you know, in terms of trying to predict what, what kids do or what they're capable of doing. Because there's a lot more to academic achievement than just your fluid reasoning ability or your IQ. But I just staying in defense of general intelligence for a second, um, or IQ, uh, IQ is not meaningless. So uh, not only does it predict some important things in life, uh, actually quite a lot of important things in life, um, there are also a certain developmental stability, stability to IQ after a certain age. So after around seven or eight, um, uh, IQ tends to stabilize. Uh, you wouldn't want to predict uh, someone's IQ uh, in their teenage years if all you have is information about their IQ at age one, for instance, because like, as you see in this chart here, uh, the correlation between IQ at age one and the correlation of IQ at age 17 is almost zero. <laughs> so um, you do want to wait a bit. Um, but there is some developmental stability. Again, this is not perfect. And we individually as a 
as a person, uh, within person, we change quite a bit throughout our lives in terms of our intelligence. Of course, I, I would hope that my age 16 intelligence was um, much more intelligent than my uh, right now in age intelligence. I'm not going to tell you how old I am. <laughs> but anyway, um, so, uh, but this is talking about relative correlation. So people who tend to be at the top of the pack on IQ tests at age eight, um, when they grow up, they do also tend to be top of the pack again when they're measured against the same people. Uh, but these are not perfect correlations and these correlations can differ across our lifespan. Psychologists have expanded our notion of intelligence though beyond general intelligence. And this is where uh, we start to get into the fascinating multiple intelligences debate because psychologists have uh, argued that we should actually view intelligence as a, as a hierarchy uh, with G or general intelligence at the top of the hierarchy and underneath of that some uh, more broad abilities um, like uh, fluid reasoning, uh, knowledge, uh, you know, some uh, referred to as crystallized intelligence, um, maybe auditory processing, visual, spatial ability. Um, th th these things comprise general intelligence. And then underneath each of those abilities, we have more narrower abilities uh, that uh, are specific skills that make up fluid reasoning, specific skills that make up visual, spatial processing, visual, specific, specific skills that make up crystallized intelligence. Um, and uh, one of the most prominent models is called the CHC model or the Cattell Horn Carroll model, the Cattell Horn Carroll integrated model of cognitive abilities, which does view intelligence as that hierarchy. But note that even within this hierarchy, you still have G or general intelligence there at the top. Um, and uh, there's still an acknowledgement that all these other, uh, quote, multiple abilities uh, are still positively correlated with each other and that some and that people who do tend to and that people who tend to do well in one of these cognitive abilities will tend to do well on the others. A really big breakout from this psycho, what we call a psychometric model, testing model of uh, intelligence, came in the 80s, I believe 1983, with the publication of Howard Gardner's seminal book called Frames of Mind, The Theory of Multiple Intelligences. Um, this is one of the books that really influenced me a lot when I was in college. And I really was getting interested in understanding intelligence. This book and another book, which I'll, I'll tell you about in a second, really deeply influenced me. Um, when I read Howard Gardner's Frames of Minds, it, it made intuitive sense to me that, well, we have multiple intelligences. We have um, not, you know, we have multiple ways of being smart at, at things in, in life. Um, and here are some of the th intelligences that uh, Howard Gardner proposed. He proposed a th linguistic intelligence. So we got the kind, of, the kind of intelligence used in reading a book or writing a poem. Uh, logical mathematical intelligence, such as the kind of intelligence uh, that comes from deriving a logical proof or solving a mathematical problem. Spatial intelligence, such as the kind of intelligence we have when we're fitting suitcases into the trunk of a car or uh, mentally rotating things in our head. Uh, musical intelligence, like your ability to sing a song or compose a symphony. Bodily kinesthetic intelligence, such as uh, your ability to dance or play football, play basketball. I think sports is associated with bodily kinesthetic intelligence. Interpersonal intelligence, such as understanding and interacting with other people. Intrapersonal intelligence, understanding oneself. Naturalistic intelligence, such as discerning, being able to discern patterns in nature. And, uh, well, actually, I should say that his proposed seven intelligences stop at intrapersonal intelligence. He has proposed that maybe, maybe there's a naturalistic intelligence, such as discerning patterns in nature, or as well as uh, maybe there's a spiritual and existential intelligence, um, such as your ability to, uh, I don't know, be intuitive uh, in understanding um, uh, human existence and um, and and being one with co the cosmos. <laughs> I don't know. You see a lot of people with self-proclaimed spiritual intelligence. Um, and Howard Garner identified a bunch of criteria for identifying an intelligence. Things like isolation by brain damage, existence, the existence of exceptional individuals. So the fact that there are people who are exceptionally, exceptionally um, gifted in uh, music, for instance, is an example that uh, music might be a, 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 sp a specific intelligence. He argued identify core, identify, there has to be an identifiable core operation essential to performance, 
you know, that we can understand the mechanism behind it, uh, that there's a distinctive developmental history leading from novice to expert, so that in each of these proposed intelligences, we know that there's a certain um, set of stages that people go through in developing expertise and intelligence in those areas. And by the way, ex- expertise and intelligence are not exactly the same thing, but that's that's for another episode. There's a lot, there'll be a lot of things to talk about in the in the coming solo episodes. I, I guarantee. Um, he also argued a distinctive evolutionary history is important, so that each one of the, each one of these seven intelligence intelligences have their own distinct evolutionary history uh, that uh, you know, are just and important that are importantly distinct from each other. Um, supportive. Uh, evidence from cognitive experimental research, he argued. Um, he argued that another criteria for accounting as an intelligence is that susceptibility to encoding in a symbol system, um, that each of these kind of intelligences have their own symbol system. Maybe it's verbal or spatial or, or something else that uh, are encoded uniquely in, in the brain. Um, and then finally, and this is the one I'm going to double click on, is supportive evidence from psychometric tests. Well, you know, there's been some criticism of Howard Garner's theory, and I think some of the criticism has been fair. Uh, even even I, though I was deeply influenced originally by the theory of multiple intelligences, I have come to appreciate some of the criticisms of it from academics, uh, from mostly academics, uh, because it's really academics who seem to care the most about this shit. <laughs> but so anyway, the academics um, have, have argued and point out that, well, Howard Garner... Uh, even with your different intelligences that you propose, uh, very few of them, if any, meet all of this criteria. You're kind of selectively picking uh, and uh, mixing and match, you know, criteria for different intelligences. So none of them really meet, meet all this criteria. But probably the the most uh, critical one uh, that 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 uh, intelligence researchers have pointed out, uh, uh, really rightly so to a large degree, is that. All the seven intelligences positively correlate with each other, forming that G factor or the general intelligence factor. It's really hard to sweep the general intelligence factor under the rug. This is a big point I want to make here. As much as people try to, it turns out that whenever you try to put it to the test, you know, try to take one of these intelligences and operationalize it. That's what psychologists call it, oper- operationalizing something. So psychologists will take uh, one of these tests and try to, to, to take it, define it, and then put it to the test to give to people to see exactly how these things correlate with each other you find that a lot of these tests are G-loaded. Uh, G-loaded is an expression just to just, just mean some of these tests um, really do correlate quite strongly with the, that general intelligence factor that we talked about earlier. So I really find this test, this study interesting by Beth, Beth Visor, uh, it might be Beth Visser, I'm sorry Beth uh, if I mispronounce your last name, Beth Visser et al., where, and I believe this is from 2006, and it's called Beyond G, Putting Multiple Intelligences Theory to the Test. You can take this test, uh, you, can, you can go uh, to Google Scholar if you want and uh, find this test, find this paper and read it. It's a really interesting paper. Um, and what they did is they attempted to uh, take each one of Howard Gardner's theory, uh, they, tried, they attempted to take each one of Howard Gardner's uh, multiple intelligences and measure them. Um, and they administer it to uh, a large group of people. And they look to see whether or not these things are really independent from each other. And surprise, surprise, uh, linguistic intelligence, spatial intelligence, and logical mathematical intelligence in particular were strongly correlated with each other uh, and were strongly correlated with that G factor. Rut row! <laughs> that's a, that's a rut row for, for those who are pure multiple intelligence theorists uh, who think there's no such thing as general intelligence. Um, at least those three, um, intelligence researchers for, for many, many years have, could have told you that, that these, that they are correlated with general intelligence. Um, but interestingly enough, even, uh, skills like interpersonal intelligence, interpersonal intelligence is, um, uh, being able to uh, have kind of like social skills or social intelligence, um, even that some of those kinds of tests, the way that they um, tried to measure that intel that intelligence was 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 still correlated uh, significantly with uh, with general intelligence. Um, but some 
Others, like intrapersonal intelligence, the ability to know yourself, know thyself, was pretty low and non-significantly correlated with, uh, the gen- with general intelligence. And um, bodily kinesthetic intelligence uh, was very low, low correlated with general intelligence. And music, some musical skills such as rhythm ability and tonal ability that they picked out were quite low in their correlation with general intelligence. Interestingly enough, naturalistic intelligence, which remember I argued was a candidate intelligence in Gardner's model, um, showed a pretty strong G-loading uh, or correlation with general intelligence. But I think that's because the way they measured naturalistic intelligence was really, in my view, like measuring three-dimensional rotation ability or visual spatial reasoning. Like uh, one of the tests was called diagramming relationships. Um, and uh, therefore, it's no surprise that that's G-loaded or correlated with general intelligence. But musical, bodily kinesthetic, and intrapersonal intelligence were not that strongly G-loaded, suggesting that Gardner was partly right, um, but he was also partly wrong in saying that all of the seven intelligences are really completely independent of each other, and that there is no such thing as general intelligence, and that doesn't make sense to talk about general intelligence. Um, he was, uh, he was, so he's partly right and partly wrong. The Psychology Podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. When you're at your best, you can do great things, but sometimes life gets you bogged down and you may feel overwhelmed or like you're not chilling up the way that you want to. Working with a therapist can help you get closer to the best version of you. I know when I'm not feeling in control of my life, I can feel very constricted and every little thing seems like a big chore. I can also get irritable and not appreciate all the good in my life. I have found that therapy is a great way to help you feel more in control of your life. And if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, flexible, affordable, and entirely online. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Personally, I find it really helpful having therapy with someone who can offer unconditional positive regard and who can give you insight into your own patterns of behavior and help you break free from the prison of your mind. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash PsychPodcast today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash PsychPodcast. Um, I now want to turn my attention to the theory of successful intelligence by Robert Sternberg. This is the, do you remember earlier I said there were two books in college that really, really deeply, deeply impacted me and deeply influenced me in, in, uh, inspiring me and in want, wanting to study intelligence and human potential. Um, and that, uh, the second book was successful intelligence by Robert Sternberg. When I read this book, um, and uh, by the way, his subtitle is How Practical and Creative Intelligence Determines Success in Life. Now, when I read this book, I was super inspired. Um, I was like, wow, um, I w- this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life. I want to study intelligence. I want to uh, know everything there is to know about intelligence and, um, and particularly uh, multiple intelligences. Uh, I really resonate a lot with particularly him talking about creative intelligence. Uh, and we'll do another episode later on about uh, creativity and uh, and uh, and whether or not there are uh, multiple creative abilities that exist. That's that's a topic for another day. But interestingly enough, Robert Sternberg included creative intelligence as part of his model of intelligence, and he also included practical intelligence or like street smarts um, as a particular aspect of intelligence. Um, I think that is um, really, really quite interesting um, that he included these, and I really resonate with that a lot. You can really think of your think of a lot of people with a lot of street smarts. Uh, people maybe grow up in the ghetto, grow up under very uh, difficult situations in life, under a lot of stress, who are really able to adapt, uh, and maybe um, that doesn't correlate necessarily with their IQ or with their uh, analytical intelligence. By the way, that's the third intelligence, analytical intelligence. Analytical, creative, and practical, he argued, together c- comprise successful intelligence. He argues that people, some people could be as good as can be on these kind of analytical IQ type tests um, and not be very creative um, and also maybe not have uh, good street smarts. Um, There's some actually really interesting research coming out recently showing that what they call stress adapted people 
uh, are, are good at all sorts of kinds of tests that are uncorrelated with IQ. That people who grow up, it, people who grow up in very, um, very stressful situations as child of they're very uh, unpredictable and chaotic, um, learn to adapt in very important ways. Um, and the question here, as the question that we have for Howard Gardner's theory as well is do we want to call these things, these extra things that go beyond analytical intelligence, do we want to call them intelligences? This is the question. This is the million-dollar question. At, at the end of the day, uh, maybe you'll you'll just say, well, this is just a semantic argument. This is just the, the kind of thing that uh, only, acad- only nerdy academics care about. Who cares whether it's intelligence or a talent? Um, but in, for, in terms of our theories of intelligence, uh, it matters and, and, and our operationalizing of these constructs in, in academic papers and how we test them. And, and, and I also think conceptually it matters in terms of how we treat kids and how we view their abilities. Do we view only a certain subset of cognitive skills as the, the true intelligence and all the other things are just talents or not? Um, I am still on the fence with this one, to be honest. I, I still am uh, trying to keep my mind open about about this. Do we want to call bodily kinesthetic intelligence a talent or an intelligence? Is it an intelligence? Uh, is someone who's a good dancer but can't reason their way out of a cardboard box uh, intelligent? Um, maybe, maybe, maybe they're intelligent at dance, um, but that, that it doesn't seem to, to mean, mean the same thing as being generally intelligent across different domains, you know, being domain, domain general in your intelligence, um, being able to be uh, quick and reason and deep and thoughtful, um, and adapt, um, to multiple situations, uh, just doesn't seem to be the same thing. What about music intelligence? Well, do we want to say that someone who's good at music um, is necessarily talented uh, or is necessarily generally smart? Um, my uh, mentor, Nicholas McIntosh at uh, University of Cambridge, uh, may he rest in peace, uh, he often made the point about sports. And because he's British, he was at the University of Cambridge. Uh, because he's British, he, he used the example of cricket. But he's like... Surely we can all distinguish between the talented cricketer who's dumb and the brilliant cricketer who maybe is not as talented. Um, I don't know. Do you think, you know, think to yourself, can you, can you make that distinction? Um, can you, when you think of basketball, can you think of, wow, uh, that player is really generally intelligent, um, but not as talented as the other players, but, or you look at someone else who's like, wow, that player is amazingly talented at basketball, but they're not that smart. Um, and so we, we really need to, to think this through, uh, intelligence or talent. I don't know. This is, um, this is the question. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments. Um, now let's talk about another, uh, form of multiple intelligences, um, an attempt to go beyond IQ. And this particular one is, is, is uniquely interesting for a number of reasons. So this is emotional intelligence. We're going to talk about emotional intelligence right now. Uh, many people who are familiar with the construct of emotional intelligence first got their introduction to it in the book in the early 90s called Emotional Intelligence, Why It Can Matter More Than IQ. And that was written by Daniel Goleman. Now, I want to say that when I first discovered this book in uh, high school, I believe I was in ninth grade in high school, I discovered this book. Um, I was like, this book is amazing. Uh, it was one of the earliest times in my life where I really realized I loved psychology. And I, I just found psychology and neuroscience fascinating because he talks a lot about neuroscience in there as well. Um, and I was sold. I was sold on the idea of emotional intelligence as Daniel Goleman presented it. Um, and the thing with, with, with the way that Daniel Goleman presented emotional intelligence is that he included so many things within that idea of emotional intelligence, so many skills, basically all the skills that are positive in the world, he included as emotional intelligence, your ability to have empathy, your ability to, um, to have social skills, to not be aw- socially awkward, your ability to get things done, to be effective. That's emotional intelligence. Um, it was only really when I got to Yale for my PhD work in intelligence research where I discovered that the original model of emotional intelligence was not created by Daniel Goleman. It was created by John Mayer and Peter Salovey. 
And in their original model of emotional intelligence, uh, they argue that there are four branches of emotional intelligence. One branch is the ability to perceive accurately, um, appraise uh, emotions, and express your emotions accurately. The second branch is the ability to access and and or generate feelings when they facilitate thought. The third branch is the ability to understand your emotions and uh, as well as the emotions of others and have emotional knowledge. Know that when someone's feeling angry, um, you understand that that's anger. And then the fourth uh, branch is the ability to regulate emotions to promote emotional and intellectual growth. This one's uh, really important. They're all important, but you could see why the person who's emotionally intelligent is able, to, when they're uh, angry, sad, to not immediately uh, spiral downward, um, but to regulate their emotions in ways that promotes their own personal growth. So this is what's interesting about the emotional intelligence thing is that uh, Daniel Goleman wrote this popular book because he went to a conference. This is the story as it was told to me. Um, is he went to a conference where John Mayer and Peter Salovey were presenting their model of emotional intelligence. And he saw a book there. He's like, wow, this would make a great best-selling book. So he went and wrote this popular book, but it went way beyond that original four-branch model. And another thing that really differed between the Goldman model and the John Mayer and Peter Salovey model of emotional intelligence is that Mayer and Salovey um, never argued that emotional intelligence was more important than IQ. In fact, they argued that it to be to count as a form of intelligence, it should correlate with IQ. You know that there should be a, at least a moderate correlation, but that there are just extra skills of emotional intelligence, such as those four branches, that are not adequately assessed on current measures of intelligence. Whereas Daniel Goleman built up the idea that emotional intelligence is the best thing since sliced bread and that it's better than IQ and it outpredicts things in life than IQ. Well, what does the data actually show about, about that question about whether or not it outpredicts IQ? This is a paper um, called A Critical Evaluation of the Emotional Intelligence Construct by Shiroki, Chan, and Caputi in 2000. By the way, there are a number of these kinds of studies that have come out now um, critically evaluating the correlation between IQ and emotional intelligence and pitting the two uh, against each other and predicting lots of outcomes in life. And I will summarize some of that research, not just this research, but I'll summarize a lot of it in a nutshell. Basically, what you find is that um, there's a small uh, correlation between IQ and um, various branches of emotional intelligence. It depends on the branch. Uh, for instance, the perception branch of emotional intelligence is more strongly correlated with IQ um, than some other branches, such as understanding and, man and managing your emotions. Um, but you also find that for things like academic achievement, Come on, IQ is still a better predictor of academic achievement, far and away better predictor than emotional intelligence. Um, you can't just sit down at a standardized test of uh, critical reasoning and and feel your way through it, <laughs> no matter how socially intelligent you are. Um, uh, but there are some domains like in uh, in relationships, in terms of life satisfaction, and in terms of just being having warmth with others and being people liking you, uh, where emotional intelligence probably does matter more than IQ, and, and the data does bear that out in some studies. Um, so there are specific domains where intelligence, emotional intelligence matters more. I imagine uh, in the helping professions, emotional intelligence skills are going to be super important. Uh, my friend Mark Brackett um, has done amazing research going in schools. He calls it emotional literacy as opposed to emotional intelligence. Uh, and Mark Brackett, by the way, he's uh, at the he's head of the, the the Center for Emotional Intelligence at Yale, uh, where which is where the original uh, emotional intelligence construct by Meyer and Salve was created. Um, and Mark Brackett teaches kids uh, various skills of emotional literacy, being able to understand your emotions, being able to identify what you're feeling and all these sorts of things. And he has found that that does predict um, various metrics in the school system, like school attendance, like um, uh, even, you know, I, I believe test performance in some ways. Now, is it going to be a better predictor than IQ? Um, I think it'd be hard It'd be hard to say that it's a better predictor than IQ. Uh, maybe some forms of, of school performance, but uh, but not all forms. But it certainly matters. I think we can conclude at the end of the day that emotional intelligence skills matter. But again, emotional intelligence has not um, made the G factor or general intelligence disappear. Um, at this point, it's really important to recognize as well that 
IQ is not the only predictor, the best predictor of academic achievement, and that there are other factors that are really important in affecting academic achievement, um, not just internal factors, but external factors. So being intrinsically motivated and what you want to do, having a cognitively stimulating home environment really matters. Research shows the amount of books on the bookshelf uh, that you grew up on with as a kid matters. Um, having social support and high expectations from those in the classroom and in your uh, in your immediate environment, like in your with your family matters. Um, having opportunities for academic enrichment really matters. Um, being able to learn active learning strategies such as taking notes and um, going to the teacher after class really matters. Having self-control, uh, self-regulation, uh, a lot of these things that come from emotional intelligence, and also having creative thinking or ability to address problems from many different angles uh, is very important for, uh, for achievement in life um, as well as academic achievement. But something I've been criticizing is that if you look at a lot of the models of gifted education in our school system and how, you know, who is the gifted child? How do we identify giftedness? You tend to find that there still is a predominant focus on IQ testing and achievement, standardized achievement tests. Um, and there, and there, and that is still very much the focus in terms of identifying you for giftedness above multiple specific abilities uh, or talents, um, whatever you want to call them, specific intelligences or specific talents, um, creativity, much, much less so considered important in the, in the idea of what makes a gifted human, um, leadership ability, uh, much, much less performing arts, uh, virtually no school, just maybe three, three states, three states consider performing arts as important for our ideas of, of giftedness. And then this last part um, really gets at the key of my, my own personal reconceptualization of intelligence, and that's that motivation is considered um, by very few schools uh, or school districts or, school st or states as important or relevant at all to giftedness. Uh, and I think that is really unfortunate um, and incorrect. Uh, we're leaving a lot of human potential on the table by our notions of what it means to be a gifted human and even what it means to be smart. And in a way in which I'm not even taking a multiple intelligence approach at the moment, um, let me tell you about my approach. And I wanted to really review the approach from everyone else so you could uh, make up your mind in totality. And I also didn't want to lead, you know, with my own ideas. But I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you a little bit about uh, my own redef ref redefinition of intelligence, and you can uh, think about whether or not you agree with it or not. Uh, as I wrote about in my book on Gifted, um, I argue that intelligence is the dynamic interplay of engagement and ability in pursuit of personal goals. Now, that is a definition that uh, sounds very complex, so let me explain it. Let me break it down for you, okay? Uh, basically, I argue that... Uh, there is such a thing as general intelligence. There is, there is in the sense that there are multiple cognitive mechanisms that interact and with developmental experiences that come together that can cause the development of someone to be generally smart. You know that there are uh, people differences in people who are generally able to reason uh, and, uh, problem solve and, and, and think on the spot and adapt to novel situations, fluid, what's called, you know, we called fluid reasoning. Um, and you can clearly see those differences among people. Um, however, personal intelligence matters just as much, if not more. I call it the theory of personal intelligence. I argue while general intelligence is not something I'm ignoring as important, there is a certain kind of intelligence that seems to come about, um, when we, um, when we're really passionate and activated about something and we really are engaged in it over the long run, uh, the long haul, we're really committed to something, really, truly committed to something. Uh, there's a certain intelligence you can only see when that, when we give people a chance to realize their personal goal over a long period of time and we also recognize that there's a, dyna a dynamic interplay between ability and engagement um, in that, that when we gain more skills and abilities, our engagement rises in that domain. We get more interested in what we're doing. And the more that we get interested in what we're doing, 
the more our ability increases. These things work together. And when we have tended to measure IQ tests uh, over the past hundred years, the way we have tended to measure, the way we tend to measure intelligence is we, we stick someone in a room and we give them a battery of, of abstract tests that are completely divorced from their lives. And we do like a one snap shot of their intelligence and we conclude all of this about their life and their future and their, their general intellectual functioning from that. And I'm not arguing we can't glean anything valuable from that. I've, I've, I've argued quite a bit today that there's a lot that we can glean from that. But uh, we leave out this personal intelligence, which may be the most important intelligence that matters to each individual human. Um, I created this uh, idea of intelligence before I, I really got into work on self-actualization, but in a lot of ways, I'm just talking about self-actualizing intelligence, the kind of intelligence that you and only you can display uh, by your own unique constellation of abilities and interests. So look, in some ways, what I'm arguing is there's no such thing as multiple intelligences. There are infinite intelligences. You know, that's one way of looking at it. You know, who, who am I to say, sit in my uh, chair with a tweed jacket, you know, in my uh, ivory tower and say, oh, I have decided that there's only these intelligences that, intelligences that count and no other intelligences count. Uh, the, the, that other one doesn't count. Uh, who am I to say that? Um, there's a certain personal form of intelligence that, that can wow everyone. Uh, when you give them a chance to tell us what their personal dreams are, what are their goals? How, in what way do they want to be judged by their intelligence anyway? Uh, in fact, probably no one wants to be judged. Uh, no one likes being judged. So there's a sense in which I'm saying that there are infinite intelligences. But before you roll your eyes, if you're an intelligence researcher, oh my gosh, infinite intelligences, multiple intelligences was bad enough. Um, also recognize that I'm a real nerd about G and general intelligence. I do think that working memory capacity, you know, the kind of mechanism, cognitive mechanisms that um, underlie general intelligence, like working memory capacity, um, your ability, like processing speed, your ability to form quick associations between things. Um, these are important skills and that people do differ in each other on uh, those skills and in fluid reasoning. Uh, but I, I really am remiss to uh, to take that fact, take those facts and stop there and not say that there isn't a more deeply personal kind of intelligence that exists in all of us uh, when we actually are motivated, uh, when we're activated, we're inspired. Um, I know personally that when I'm uninspired by something um, and you stick a test on me, I can look pretty dumb. But then when I'm activated, like I am right now, like I am today, in in my excitement and in, in uh, explaining to you all the 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 fascinating mysteries of of intelligence theory and multiple intelligences, um, there's a I I I, I, w I would assume I appear smarter, you know, and uh, I um, appear more uh, intellectually alive, so to speak. <laughs> I've never quite used that phrase before, um, and. You know, I've worked with, uh, I've seen it, I've seen it up front. You know, I've, I've worked with an organization, an educational nonprofit called the Future Project. Uh, and, uh, I really love what they do. They have like the office of the dream director where, uh, any student can go to the office of the dream director and, um, and, uh, and tell the student and the student can tell the dream director what their dreams are in life and, and what they want to do. Uh, they, you know, they'll say like, Oh, I want to end bullying or, Oh, I want to, um, uh, I want to make the world a better place and, uh, do this and that. And, and the, you know, the dream director says, great, let's help you get there. No questions asked. It's not like, you know, we have to give you an IQ test to see whether or not you meet a certain criteria to be able to make the world a better place. No, it's just like give you that that personal that that opportunity to to display your personal intelligence. And you see a lot of these kids transform. A lot of these kids who were ridden off um, really get become alive. And um, uh, and people are like, wow, that person's pretty darn smart after all. Um, so where are we at with this question that started this whole topic today? So I think that. Uh, I, I hope I've shown you today that certainly multiple uh, abilities exist. 
Um, and the more cognitively complex they are, in the sense that the more those cognitive abilities um, are on the spot and abstract and divorced from our life and, uh, and, uh, and can uh, apply to a variety of situations, um, the more they will be positively correlated with each other, forming a general intelligence factor. So general intelligence does exist. But I'm going to be nuanced here and say that general intelligence exists and multiple intelligences exist. Both are true at the same time. You often see some, some people like Howard Garner will say multiple intelligences exist, therefore there's no, no such thing as general intelligence. But I, I'm not saying that. I think that both multiple intelligences exist and general intelligences exist. And personal intelligence exists, uh, which can only be seen when someone actually asks you what lights you up and gives you the resources and opportunity to realize your dreams. Well, what do you all think? Uh, this was my first standalone episode. I uh, really hope you found it informative, and I hope it generated a discussion. So please weigh in in the comments section, message the Psychology Podcast, and let us know what kinds of topics you would like us to cover um, on this uh, special series of standalone episodes that we're calling the Human Potential Lab. I hope everyone enjoyed this, and until next time, uh, stay smart in your own way. Peace. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.